Are we live now, Shannon? All right, we are live. Thank you all so much for coming back for this part of this celebration, which is a conversation with my girlfriends. And I'm going to start by saying that they have talked about me really bad behind my back and to my face because because I did not prepare them for anything. And they, and they said, well, what we going to do? I said, what we do? And, uh, and so one of them, I ain't going to say who, but Mella said, uh, <laughs> what if I cuss? And I was like, well, these are cussing times. So we're going to do our best not to since we kind of in the chapel, but these are cussing times. And so we're going to try to behave ourselves. But the point, so I wanted you to experience now, I don't know if you're going to actually, we're going to actually pull this off, but I guarantee you everybody up here is going to be real. But I wanted you to experience what it was like for the original, the original brunch crew from St. Paul's Baptist Church to meet after church and kind of help one another be the professional women that we are. So, so Mela, uh, Melanie Price, who is, uh, who is uh, zooming in, that's her waving at you now. Everybody wave at that camera. Okay. <laughs> Um, is a, is a, a associate professor, associate professor uh, in poli sci and African American studies at Rutgers, and she uh, wrote the book *The Race Whisper* about Obama's preg uh, pre I said pregnancy. Lord have mercy. <laughs> now that would be a thing. That would be a thing. <laughs> Presidency and the way in which that uh, affected race relations in, in the U.S. And so, but that ain't why she's on this call. I just want y'all to know my friends will fly. <laughs> right. Um, and then, okay, starting on this end, um, um, uh, Leslie Morant Esquire is a, um, a, an attorney, and she, she specializes in uh, food justice and in health. Uh, inequities that yeah is that right that's, that's, yeah, that's close enough all right yes, right and she's, and she's a trainer which you're gonna hear a little bit about because some of her contrary uh, clients are on this dais <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah okay <laughs> I'm confessing, I'm good. She confessing right now until you really start going at her. And then uh, Reverend Cherise Tucker, who is the administrative uh, pastor, administrative minister at St. Paul's Baptist Church in Philly and makes everything run and, I mean, like for real, yeah. and, and gets all the grief for that Amen. because, you know, because people got to pick on somebody. And, and the fact that she... Uh, the fact that Sharice don't cuss somebody out every day <laughs> is a miracle. <laughs> it's a... Pick, 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 up the, pick up the mic and say that. It's so God. She said, it's so, so God. God. All right. And then, uh, the, I, mo I almost said reverend, but she ain't no reverend, and she will cut me for saying that. <laughs> She said, don't even start. I'm going to put you on a list. Uh, Brittany Cooper, who uh, wrote three books in less than 18 months. I don't know how she did that. But the one that, that you may really be thinking about right now is, oh, Lord, Eloquent Rage. Eloquent Rage. I'm, I had it in my head. Eloquent Rage, which is uh, the power of black feminism uh, and how black fem how she got her power. And I got, I got superpower. the superpower. I was like, I got the subtitle wrong, but that ain't even point. Eloquent rage. Go get it. Yeah. You got to read it. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, so some, one of my students said, you know, Brittany Cooper. And I was like, I even have her number in my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, and then my pastor, uh, Leslie Dawn Callahan, who is the first woman pastor at St. Paul's. Baptist Church in, uh, which is an American Baptist and UCC, is it UCC? No, the church PNBC. is a PNBC, uh, in, uh, Philly. And the first woman pastor of a, it's 129 years, 100, almost 100, 128 years. She is the fifth pastor. They have long tenure there. And so she's the fifth pastor of 128 year. And she is my, like, so just a brief story about me and Leslie. We didn't know each other. She was on a womanist listserv. 
and the word came out that she had been elected at St. Paul's. And many of you may not know, but I started a congregation, helped start a congregation in Austin, Texas. And I told her, I, I said, you don't know me, but I want to tell you this. I am going to be... I, uh, but I, but you didn't know me like we weren't friends. You didn't know me. Um, this is my story. You can okay. tell it however you, you can tell it however you want to when I give you the mic. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, 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 I think I emailed you. I emailed her and said, let me say this to you. I said, here's the thing about being a woman pastor. People are gonna, about being a pastor at all. People are gonna always complain. Do not give your energy to the complainers because they really only about 15 20 percent don't waste your time with those people i'm not saying don't attend to what they are concerned about but don't give don't them give all them that away. energy and she and I, i'm telling you and then i put her on my bb list which she alluded to which is i have i one of my chief spiritual gifts that comes from my grandmother my mother actually is intercession and i told her you're on my bb list which is my before breakfast list they're a group of people i pray for before i do anything else and she's on that list so this is the crew this is the brunch crew and like i said that i don't have no clue what this is about to be but uh somebody get a mic and go so Mel, what you want to say? I'm the chair of the trustees. I want some church credit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> These are church people. And let me say, she deserves it. Melanie, because Renita Weems prophesied to her, said, You need to, to tell her, you need to. If she would be a trustee, pick it up. So uh, for my fifth pastoral anniversary, which was four years ago, I invited Renita Williams to preach. Um, and in a gathering um, in like the hotel kind of afterwards as we're all kind of sitting around doing what we do after church, which is the thing to know about this group is that it's just what we do after church. Um, we're sitting in that room and I had been trying to convince Melanie that she would be a good trustee. And Melanie was doing that thing. <laughs> You're an excellent trustee. She was doing, she was doing that thing. And, um, and I'll let Melanie tell you some of how this actually felt for her. But Renita Weems said to her, girl, you better go on and be a trustee. If you be a trustee, you'll get tenure. And then she was scared not to be. <laughs> I keep telling people I believe in about five. So we start, we can't hear you. We can't Mel. hear you, Melanie. We can't hear you. Start over. I, can you hear me now? Yes. I keep telling people I still believe in about 5% that lightning God that will strike you down when people tell you to do stuff. So I always try to make sure that I'm not going to get struck down just in case <laughs> that God still exists in my life. Oh, and the, and the, and the moral of that story is you did get tenure. You did. Uh, like, <laughs> Renita Williams is a true prophet. Okay, so can I tell the, and so then the next part of the story is, so she becomes the, she, she becomes a trustee, and I was preaching in Texas, which is where she's from. She's from Houston, Texas. So I'm down there, I'm preaching for the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and we are doing what we do. It was the day after I preached, we're sitting around the pool, and we are with a bunch of preacher people. Melanie happens to be there because she was at home visiting, and at this point, I'm now trying to get her to be the chair of the trustees. <laughs> and so I'm saying, so we're there, Dr. Emma Jordan Simpson is there, Dr. Gina Stewart is there, there are a couple of other folks sitting around the table, and I'm like, she really is the right person for the job. She don't want to do it, because who wants to do it? But she's really the right person for the job. And uh, we were finishing up our lunch, and Gina Stewart stood up, Melanie was sitting over here, Gina Stewart put her hand on her shoulder and was like, you got to, do, you know, you got to do this. You know, this is what God wants you to and do. And I said, get your hand off of me. Get your hand off of me. <laughs> so that's August. By September, she was saying yes. And she's been a phenomenal chair of the trustees. Yes. So, so I do kind of want want Mella, Mella and Brittany and Leslie especially to talk about what it's been like to roll with a bunch of preachers. This is going to be funny. 
Go ahead, Mayor uh, Leslie. See, they, they put me on the spot to tell this story. Um, but I, so I'm going to start with these women freed me from fundamentalist Christianity. Okay, you need to put the mic a little bit closer. Okay, so these women freed me from fundamental Christianity. That is what I know. I was raised in fire and brimstone. It is all I've known all of my life. It is all that most of my black friends who say that they are Christians, it is what we know. So I came to this group because um, Dr. Marlette Frederick introduced me to Leslie electronically to be her. She was looking for a trainer, and I'm a, also a personal trainer. So I trained Leslie, then Leslie introduced me to Sharice, and I began visiting um, St. Paul's Baptist Church. Um, after I, I left my church at, during the process of my divorce, so I really wasn't that interested because good Christians don't really be messing with divorced Christians all that much, you know. I'm, I'm serious, I'm, this, is the, this is my background, this is my story. So I was like, you know, whatever, um, I'm good on y'all too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to church and, and then I was like, oh, they eat afterwards, I'm about my food. So okay, we go to church and then we eat, this is great. And so for weeks I'm listening to them, um, they are the first women preachers I've ever met in my life. In my tradition, you know, women got to teach Sunday school, they got to do the kids, you know, and all of that kind of stuff, but they were not in the pulpit ever, except on Women's Day. So, you know, <laughs> right, except on Women's Day. And so my youngest daughter loves them dearly. She's like, mom, I like them feminist preacher chicks. And I'm like, I don't like them feminist preacher chicks. So before the, the official name is the brunch crew in my household, it was, oh, we going, we hanging out with the feminist preacher chicks. And so I'm sitting around lunch with them one day and um, they are literally casually eating. And then they begin to tell the story of Vashti. And she said, and Leslie says, well, you know, when, when the king wanted her to come and prostitute herself in front of the men, and I went, oh, oh what, what you talking about? I've read this story six, seven, I've read the Bible cover to cover. What are you talking about? And so they kept talking. And, and then everybody's like, yeah, well, that's what she did. And I'm like, well, what? I'm not dumb. I've read this. <laughs> what exactly are you trying to say? So I didn't say anything at the time. So then Leslie just looked up casually and said, yeah, we'll go read the story. I was like, okay. So I go back home and I read, and then they start talking about Esther and how she was in the concubine hair and had sex with the king. What, hot the, what, Esther is the lady we all supposed to be trying to be. We supposed to bathe in milk and honey to get a man. That's what Esther is about. We are supposed to bathe in incense and frankincense and myrrh and get good skin for a year before you're ready to meet the man. That's what Esther is and something about some sacrifice for the kingdom, right? And this, I'm not kidding. This is the only way it has ever been preached to me. And so I go home. And I opened up this Bible that I have read cover to cover several times, and it was as though somebody said, Psh. <laughs> <laughs> And I opened up my eyes and said, this is bull. And I literally <laughs> I have been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and led astray. People who I've entrusted my spirituality to all of my life have lied to me. What is this Bible? What is this? Now, this is devastating news to them because I really was shook. No, tell, tell how you... So we, okay, so we good. We think we, we good because we not doing nothing but, like, we just talking. That's what we do. <laughs> we just talking about the Bible. We just talking about, but we talking about the way we talk about it. But and well, hold on now. And then Leslie, in this something something, in this conversation, this is what really messed me up. Leslie said, well, the Bible's wrong. The Bible is the problem. Shh. <laughs> We almost killed her. This the preacher woman. <laughs> she got a PhD. I done Googled her. <laughs> she famous and stuff. And the rest of them, these is people, these people. She speak Hebrew. Wait a minute. I am shook. I'm, no, I'm, I'm shook. Because these people in my tradition, they got power. They know some stuff that I don't know, and they just said the Bible is wrong, and I'm waiting for the floor Lightning. to open up and all of us. <laughs> because thou shalt not touch God's anointed, but you don't speak in blasphemy. And oh my God. And so it was just, 
it, 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 I'm not out of this period. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, but, but, you know, in, in this, these times of justice, and I've met this Brittany and Mella, and I'm reading their stuff, their books and articles, and, and then this whole, this Bible is not the inerrant word of God, which I can joke about it, but that is what I was told all of my life, that this Bible is the inerrant word of God. What y'all talking about? 50, they're too old for this kind of stuff. <laughs> Y'all should have let me die in my bondage <laughs> and hope that I made my way in when I died. And I'd have been kind of all right. I'd have been harmful, but I'd have been, you know, okay. Now I'm just spiritually all messed up. And then, and then Valerie, I'm like, you know, my, and then I meet CG over here who belong up here, but he won't say, but whatever, this ain't my panel. So, you know, we start talking about, you know, the, giving honor to our ancestors. And I have never heard a black minister talk about, b because black African tradition was voodoo stuff. Right. It, was, it was harmful. Right. It was, and then I start doing some more reading. So Leslie, now my, Leslie. Tell them about when Valerie introduced us to imprecatory hey. prayers. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So for and those, said, wait a minute. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. For I'll those of you who didn't hear Mella, she said, it. tell you about the time that Valerie introduced us to imprecatory prayers. Now, I can't even remember what the context was. It was some mess about my ex-husband. Oh. <laughs> Listen. Oh, oh yeah. That kind of prayers is all right. <laughs> Praying right now. Let's do this. But, but I what remember. You I, do, I do remember I saying. I do remember saying. Will I am not opposed prayers. to imprecatory prayers. Yes. And I had I, not that opposed. I didn't know what it was. And I was like, so you telling me this is okay? Okay. All right. Well then, y'all do. But it. It. And, and. But this is where I was in my life. And oh, they saying what's and, an imprecatory and these women prayer? Helped me. They began to, to help me see that what I had taught, had been taught, was a white patriarchal form of Christianity that was harmful. And I was like Paul, I was the chief. I mean, when you say Christian, I was the Christian of the Christian. All that nonsense, and I look at but what the things that I had spewed, you know, things that I had spoken and the harmful things, but they help, but it, I'm still sort of landing in this ame spiritual amoeba place. Like, so when I pray now, I mean, what's in you is in you. What you were trained to do, you were trained to know and believe. But like, it takes me three minutes to start off a good prayer, because I believe like, Heavenly Father, wait, is it is not gender well wait a minute heavenly father um that's what i know god that may or may not be female there may be no gender to you at all but giving honor to the ancestors those i know and i don't know anybody y'all think i'm joking y'all think i'm joking y'all think i'm joking i'm not joking I, this is how i pray it takes me two minutes to ask or praise anything because i don't know who i'm talking to and I'll be asking them, and they be like, we sorry. And I'm like, I, just, I don't need sorry. Tell me who I'm supposed to be talking to, and does it have a name? So, so it's like a year later. And I remember, because I remember we, had, we were at a soul, we don't always go to a soul food place. The Sunday when this happened, we were at a soul food place. And I remember the greens was real good. So when she says we're just talking, like, it literally was like, but these greens, though, y'all. Like, it's so we don't know this devastation has happened. She doesn't let us know. And we, we make assumptions. I mean, when you, when you, when your people are your people, you're used to that kind of, you're used to the critical analysis. You're used to the humor. You're used to the profanity. You're used to the crazy. It's a part of our life. You're used to the moments of worship. It just, we flow in and out of it. It's not compartmentalized. It's how we live our lives. And so it's about a year later and I'm in my car and I'm talking to her and, um, you know, we're on the phone. And I'm just kind of sitting and we were talking about a whole bunch of stuff. And she says, I mean, like, because you all devastated me because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, what? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? And she, that's not the point. Her point is something else. And now I am devastated. Because, uh, you know, I, we were talking about this briefly last night. Um, when Dr. Bridgman started A Woman Preach, um, we had a conversation earlier, um, you know, in the early days of Woman Preach, about what it means to do this kind of work 
where you know you are dismantling people's lifetime understanding of things. It's different when you're in seminary. You pay money to be destroyed up in this country. <laughs> you sign up. I mean, what you get is what you get. Sally may help you destroy your life, right? But random people don't necessarily sign up for that. And so my, you know, I, I'm, I'm always, and maybe in some places too concerned about it, but I'm always like, listen, you know, everybody ain't make it back from Jason and the Argonauts. Some of them people got killed, you know? Some of them jumped over, some Loch Ness monsters killed some people. This journey for a better life, Everybody don't make it off the ship that starts off. And so I'm always like, I think it's important to let people know to not play games with them like that, to make assumptions that they'll process it all well, to say things flippantly, and then you go on about your life and your greens, and they're left with the pieces without, without signing up for it willingly. And this isn't just a random person. This is my friend now. And when I get brave again, it's gonna be my trainer again. So I need her not to be crazy. <laughs> I need her not to be all broke up. Um, but it's the thing, you know, and so it's taken me about two years to not feel as bad as I felt um, in that moment. Um, and because she says there's no reason for us to feel bad about it. But it's the thing, again, when you're used to just being um, I mean, this is what we do. It, it, it has helped me to be more mindful that in the humor and in the craziness of our conversation, which, um, you know, I find conversation with black women my anchor, yes. you know. Um, it's the thing that keeps me um, not just sane, but keeps, it is the adhesive um, and sometimes the duct tape that keeps me together till I can get better care, right? right? And so I don't ever wanna do, I don't ever wanna do anything that's gonna bring damage. Um, and, and I don't know that we wouldn't have had that conversation. I don't even know if anything would have been really differently. We just probably would have called you more. <laughs> Girl, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. You all right? You wanna yeah, come right. to Bible study? What you, what you doing? You wanna go get drinks? What you want? You need some wine, what you need. Um, and so that's the thing that, you know, that, that, that for me would have, would have just been different. I mean, a year was too long. I don't, can't even believe but, you but waited. They, don't, they freed me. They keep feeling bad. And I'm like, I don't feel bad. I, thank you, Valerie. No, thank you. Right. But, but I'm like, why y'all feel bad about, like, like, free, like literally, I went back to the, I, you know, I, still, I had a difficult time with the Bible after that. I just did. I was like, what is it? And I still do. I still do. Um, but when you go from uh, a philosophy that is homophobic, that is white supremacist, and all of those things, and now I'm not there. Now, granted, I'm not in church and tithing about 17% like I used to, but I that's mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's a problem. I mean, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I mean. So, so let me just say, oh, so, yeah. so this is the church. So right, this is the, this is the, this is my life in ministry though. This is the thing. So if you don't have that, you're going to hell if you don't. If you don't have all of that, then people just decide whether they're going to or not. And I think that one of the challenges I have just as the, the pastor of the church that I am trying to pastor and trying to do this the way I think is the right way to do it is that you, if you don't have the stick, people don't. So what, what Leslie, Leslie wasn't kidding. She at that church where they were oppressing her and she was giving 17% of her income to them people. Like she was tithing and then she was pressing herself to get above the tithe. And she was going to church four or five times a week. I see her once a quarter. <laughs> She come to brunch more often. No, she meets us after she, church. She still come to brunch. Right, right. Let me. 
that Let me say why I said, I, yes, I, if I were the pastor of St. Paul's, like I would really feel that because that, that's a real thing. I've been a pastor. That's a real thing. You want people to be committed out of freedom and not out of fear. But most people are committed to church out of fear and obligation. And it's just hard. That, that is an absolute hard thing. And if you keep being committed to it as you are, it just, it can be depressing. I mean, I, I, I know, baby. That's why I prayed for you before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but but the reason I said I'm, it doesn't bother me is because Leslie keeps being a part of the community, and I if if she if she had gotten devastated and never come back, if she had become devastated and never kept the conversation going, I ain't saying she gonna get back to seventeen percent of her time, but this allows her to come into the freedom of. <laughs> they negotiating up here. How about seven? <laughs> <laughs> is there more is there more <laughs> but you get what i'm saying i mean it's like but you keep coming to the porch or to the to the restaurant or and you give and you keep showing up right exactly so so that's why i say i'm not bothered because the truth makes us free it pisses us off first as gloria steinem said I mean, right? But, but uh, oh, I think she was the first one to say that, right? Uh, it, but, but, but part of us, I remember when I was doing the, the thing on sexuality at the church, I can't remember which one of the saints it was, 80-something-year-old sister. God, who was it? Don't call the name. Uh, but anyway, afterwards, she came up to me, and she said, I am really mad. And I said, why? She says, because somebody could have told me this about the Bible a long time ago. <laughs> And this is the work that, that womanist, feminist preachers and leaders are finding ourselves in. They, uh, mostly male, I'm not male bashing, but mostly male pastors because of power, not authority, have, have wielded this power by, say, by telling people things and then saying, and you can't question me, you can't touch God's anointing. Um, so I think don't make don't make me i have threatened her today so that will be sufficient um so just listening to the stories i think that um for me there's a similar thing so you know i come from my folks are my dad stepdad is a baptist preacher in louisiana um, in the northern part of Louisiana, so I come from very traditional Baptist folks. And it's sort of surreal sitting in this room because Dr. Renita Weems is the first woman I ever heard preach, and I didn't hear her till I was in college at Howard University where she used to preach at the chapel. H, you, you know. Hey. We everywhere, we are legion. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, and so, and then Callahan is the first pa female pastor that I ever had. Um, because even when I heard Renita Weems preach, you know, I was like, well, this is an interesting idea. Women preaching. Okay. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. I still remember the sermon. I think I even remember the date she gave it. Um, wow. But, so it marked something for me. And at the same time, I didn't have a framework to put it in. Um, and so I think that that's the thing that I can say about the brunch crew is that they became a framework for the faith that I was searching for. Um, because what I was looking for, first of all, I was not planning on going back to church. I had moved to New Jersey after living in Alabama. Um, I had gone through the Atlanta Baptist mega church thing. And any of you who are familiar know that's a thing. You're welcome, Brittany. You're very welcome. <laughs> Negro, if you would let me get my sentence out, I'm already going to give you credit. I was shocked. See, see, Melanie Price like to steal your thunder. That's how she do with the story. So I was she going. Your girl to your, she <laughs> gale to your Oprah. Yeah, I mean, fair enough, fair enough. So, so I was not going to church because Atlanta I had. Atlanta mega church. I was at, yeah, I was in the Atlanta mega church thing real hard and doing ministry work and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I started asking questions and I had the director of Christian education call me into the back office and say, you know, some people wish you would just shut up. Oh, um, and so I was like, wow, wow. wow. 
Wow. So, I, you know, so I moved a couple of places, finally landed in Jersey, and then I went to some a mega church there, and the pastor that day was talking about Creflo Dollar and how it was totally reasonable that he beat his 15-year-old daughter with a shoe. And so I just got right on up while he was talking and walked out, which was a huge protest for a girl who thinks we don't stand up when the preacher is talking. The preacher stand and we sit. We don't move. And so I got right on up and walked out. And I was like, oh, I don't need to do this no more. Y'all, I don't know what y'all talking about. And so I met Melanie being at Rutgers. And she said, you know, I've been going to this church in Philly. And the way she described it, she said, you know, it's an interesting place. It's two women, two black women with natural hair. <laughs> leading a Baptist church and I was like that that is okay I'm gonna I'm check it out so so and that that became the thing um, and over the years then we started doing the the after church brunch and what I loved is that uh, you know m because my dad is a preacher I already knew who Baptist preachers are when they're not in the pulpit and you know and knew they were cussing somebody's and show out real bad tell the uh, truth <laughs> Tell the truth and you know, shame but the devil. I, but I didn't know how to integrate. But look, that thing was gendered. My dad, you know, they're these male preachers. You know, it's him and his boys. <laughs> and I didn't know how that looked for me. And so what I wanted was a faith that was integrated. I wanted to be able to cuss because I cuss like a sailor. I'm not cussing today, but typically I would be. Uh, <laughs> um and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to cuss. I wanted to be able to think about love in ways that felt progressive. I wanted to, you know, and I wanted to be able to have my questions. But here's the other thing, though, because the stuff that's in you is in you. But I also needed somebody who could preach, like who can actually preach. I don't want, I don't like, like, preach now. I need you to preach. <laughs> Because, because here's the thing, I am a preaching snob and I grew up here in some of the finest preachers in this country. Most of them were men, but not all of them were. But still, you know, if you've gotten to hear people who preach in the tradition of a Gardner Taylor, you just can't hear any old person. And so when I heard Callahan, I said, well, we might have, well, then she can preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I mean, literally, and that's, you know, that Baptist thing, that was the kind of thing. And I was like, no, she can preach. And they sing black people music. And, and so I was like, this unicorn of St. Paul's where you get traditional black worship and progressive preaching is an amazing thing. And I feel really thankful for it. And then when you go after church and your pastor is like, try this bourbon. I'm on bourbon now. Drink this bourbon. <laughs> I don't think she wanted that piece out. <laughs> Yo. So they, they, they were around when I discovered bourbon. Yes. I had gone. Snail? Yes, so I had oh, gone. Uh, so I actually was there. Where's Ed Aponte? Uh, I I was actually. You have. You are responsible for this. <laughs> I was in Louisville to do something at the Louisville Institute, and my friend who lives in Louisville, Shannon Craig Snell, picked me up, and we went to dinner that night. And she was like, "I'm gonna get this bourbon flight. Have some." I was like, I don't know about that bourbon thing, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, and I was like, well, what you say here? <laughs> look at here, look at here. So I come back. So the, thing that's, so the thing that's remarkable about this is that I come back and I'm on bourbon. I'm like, yo, I went away and I got this bourbon thing. And look, right. here's so. And I was like, I need grown women's liquor. And so here we go. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, so that's the thing is that part of it is that I feel like we have church for sure, but there is a kind of church that happens during brunch that is, that moves in between the ability to just sort of be good girlfriends and then to get a theological analysis that'll change your life. And you're like, I never thought about that that way before. And so it's so, I saw a level of integration of faith that I really strive for and that I had never seen. And so I feel like, Here's the thing that, that this crew, what they mean to me is that they are the people who helped me put the pieces back together again. Because what it, it was never sufficient for me. Like the one thing that is not negotiable, um, even as a person in the secular academy and, and women's and gender studies, you know, in the secular academy, folks love to act like they too smart for God. Um, and that just wasn't never my thing because I was like, look, half the time y'all talking crazy to me in this PhD program and half the time my imposter syndrome has me feeling like I can't make it because I'm not smart enough. And the only people 
who in those moments were the church people at my Baptist mega church who were like, baby, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine. And we're praying for you. And it didn't matter that they, we didn't agree theologically because they could still get an, a prayer through. And they were the reason that I made it through. And so I was like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to buy into your, your idea that your smarts going to save you because there's some stuff your smarts can't keep you. You know, and so I was like, I'm a person who needs God because I know how I got here and I know who keeps me. And I wanted to be able to do Please, Brittany. <laughs> all of these, all y'all, all y'all. I told y'all I wasn't cussing. So. But look, but it's, it, it, to me it feels really important to say that because I think a lot of folks go around in the academy hiding their faith um, because they feel like, you know, folks think that they can't be smart and critical. And then I met all these sisters and they're just so brilliant, so thoughtful, so well read. And so we could flow in and out of a conversation and it was a model for me of the thing that I was trying to be. And so they put me back together again and said, all the pieces of you fit. And anybody who tells you that you have to choose that you can't be everything in every space. It's a lie. Um, okay, and, I'm, really and, I'm, and I'm so I'm thankful for that because look, that's why I roll with a crew. Right. That's why my, that's my sort of, right. my like fundamental core credo is I ride for black girls. Um, I'm a black girl's black girl. Uh, look, sometimes black girls ain't quite right, but even if I don't like you, I will stand up for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah when stuff when people come for you because those two things are separate i have a love ethic around black girls because i'm very clear that i'm my safest when i'm with black girls yeah. and so to meet yeah. some preaching women because the other thing the last thing i want to say is because they also taught me something different about who i understood god to be part of the reason that i you know i grew up watching folks you know i grew up thinking about like being a preacher and all that kind of stuff and you know, I don't, God ain't said nothing real formal to me about that. Real formal? She said real formal. Y'all heard it right. I'm not going to do this. Keep I'm your eyes this. on the prize. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do this with y'all because, because I'm, I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. All right. Who said it? This is why I love my crew. <laughs> okay. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> yeah. So it's look. I feel like I'm doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing, and part of. But here's the thing, Callahan, that I think is tough for you. But part of what it, part of why I don't feel so pressed is because I have watched so many different kinds of people come through St. Paul's who are people of faith that I feel a freedom to sort of be my full self in every space. And so I don't feel like to be a preacher or to, right. to be committed to this work right. looks That's one so. way. Because, you know, look, because Callahan and Valerie and um, Andrea Alexander and, you know, Starsky Wilson, those folks, those are my movement pastors. When I saw uh, uh, Andre Andrea this morning, I was like, I met you in the streets of Ferguson. So I have watched these folks motivate their ministry in every facet of their lives. And so I don't feel the need for That's it to right. look any particular That's kind right. of way. Right. What I'm thankful for is that I feel more, look, I feel more spiritually healthy now than I've ever felt in my life. I feel right. more integrated now than I've ever felt in my life. Right. I feel like I can get a prayer through and I, and I, if I can't, I know who to call. Uh, and you know, and you know, and, and because I was so worried before trying to follow all the rules of the church, I feel the most saved in my life that I've ever felt now. Um, and that is the evidence for me that I'm where I'm supposed to be. I really feel like we need to pass a basketball. Not just because of what you said, but Mel, I don't know if you want to say more about this too, but as you're trying to figure out what you want to say about that, it reminds me of when Jahab was with us in Lancaster in 2010. Was it what 2010? And we were sitting in my little small apartment, had forgotten to get food, so I had to go get some mac, some some spaghetti from somewhere, and we threw some spaghetti on. Who was in that room? Leslie uh, Toom was there. Uh, Tanya Ray was there. 
Kanye Ray was there, Dion was there. It was, yeah. So these are the people I've been riding with for a while. So we're in the room and we're doing what women do. I think all women do this, but black women show enough do this. We talk between the things that black women do, which is we went from God to food, to problem, to sex, to God, to food, to problem, to sex. I mean, this is what women talk about. Now, brothers, y'all know. We don't talk about y'all, but we do talk about sex. But we do talk about sex. But we ain't, ta but we ain't talking about y'all. How you can have the best possible sex that you can be having. This is, it's a strategy session right. always. And, 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 and we, and then, then people start come doing confessional stuff, like doing healing work, you know, because we are also healers and we're crying and all that. And we, and we are, and red wine is flowing because that's my sacrament. And, um, <laughs> yes, Lord. And, uh, and I just forgot that Jaha was in the room. She was in the corner. We're, we're all in the room, but she had slipped into the corner. And after all this, and we're up crying, and then we're in the circle, and we're praying, and we're laying hands on each other, and all that. Jaha, who is also a lay woman, I'm telling the story for you, Leslie, said to us, I don't even know what the gospel plow is, but y'all got y'all hand on it? We're going to be all right. <laughs> you, remember that? you remember that? Right. Mella? All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Um, first, let me say, I actually came to this in a really uh, interesting way. I have a book of poetry signed by Valerie from when she came to my home church. My mother saw her read and said, I saw this woman read. I think you would, because I used to write poetry. I, I saw this woman read. I think she would be helpful to you. And this was in 1995. What was In Search of Warriors Dark and Strong, right? So it was in the 1990s. And it was also around this time where at the church that I was going to at the time, Renita Wings would come there and do revival all the time. She would, um, Claudette Copeland, Ernestine Green, these women would come through. Now that church took a turn after that. <laughs> but at the time that I was there, it was really a place where it felt empowering to be a woman in Christianity. Um, Yolanda Heron Palmore would have these women's Bible studies and there'd be like 200 women in there. And you know, my mother is very religious. I come from a church background, all that stuff. But then I didn't go to church for a whole decade. I was like, the politics are bad. The place where I was living at the time, the music is bad and I can't have bad politics and bad music. <laughs> like we can't all go together. I thought for a minute about being a Unitarian, but they don't have gospel. It was like a whole lot of things um, happening. And so my, I have a twin sister and she knew Leslie. And so I went to the first, the day I met her the day before I saw her preach. And I was like, I really hope you can sing. Just joking. Cause I prefer my preachers to sing. <laughs> it seemed like a funny thing to say. And I will say anything if I think it's funny. All of them will agree to that. Um, but I had moved to this region because I had been denied tenure where I was before. And so I had not only not been going to church, but I was actually moving here on the heels of a very difficult time in my life. And so I liked Leslie and Sharice and Diane and I, so I would show up periodically to go to brunch. And then I thought, what kind of person are you? Your mother did not raise you like this. You have to go to church and brunch. Like you cannot, <laughs> you cannot do, you cannot just show up at the end of people's church and be like, I hope it was fine. Now let's go get mimosas. Like it cannot, that can't work. So slowly but surely I became sort of involved in this church. And actually the first thing I did, um, outside of a regular church service was the very first day Bella ever came to the church. Yeah. So I actually marked my time there by her, her growth. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I will say is every church I've ever been involved in, I've been heavily involved, but I had no real intentions of being involved in the ways that I am now. But I, the thing that has been the best about it is it has brought me into community with all these women preachers and and i think about 
Like I literally said, I just told Gina Stewart to get her hand off my shoulder. And that's like a big thing to say, right? She's <laughs> Gina Stewart, right? And so you meet all of these women and they're very powerful. And I have my own sense of what, you know, a, my own sense of, you know, what Christianity looks like for me, but they also allow me to have a space where I can live it out. Frankly, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Leslie C. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember telling her, like, I mean, I don't know if you can be my fa my pastor and my friend because I cuss in front of my friends and I don't think you're supposed to cuss in front of your pastor. <laughs> Like, you, we, we cannot do both. I was very concerned about this. And she was like, oh, no, you can cuss in front of me if I'm your pastor. And I said, all right, then. Then we can actually probably bring something together. But the thing that I, I will say about all of the women on that panel is they are affirming. You learn something from them no matter how long you've known them. They will show up with a story you've never heard before that will bless your life. They ride for you. They show up for you um, and they have a kind of empathy. I will say this about Leslie Morant, who's told you a lot about her journey, but she actually probably, she was my trainer at one point. It was a very short lived time, not because of her. Not because of her, but I just wasn't in a mental space. You know what I'm saying? And so I was doing these exercises and she was like, you can do it. And I was in a lot of pain, but it was also at the same time that I was putting my tenure file in. And I was like, I cannot be mentally struggling and also be struggling to pee. Like these things cannot go together. And the thing she said to me is, all right, then we'll back off. I'll figure out something else you could do. Right. Right. right? That's the way they are with everything. You can say, Today, I cannot hear the thing you're trying to tell me. Right. And they will say, that's all right, because I'm going to remember it and come back to it. <laughs> right. 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 But today is not the day that you have to, you have to do this thing. Right. And they hold you in the moments, even when you're making bad choices, they hold you in that moment. They don't say that choice. I mean, they don't say it's a good choice. They say, you got, it's, apparently this is something you need to keep doing and I'm going to watch, let you keep doing it. But when it's time for it to be over, I'm also going to be like that girl, you know, that was crazy. Let's talk about how that thing. <laughs> Let's talk about how that thing cannot happen again. And so that's a kind of, um, spiritual work in its own way. Uh, my sister refers to us all as she doesn't call us the brunch, brunch crew. She calls us my drinking church friends. You and your drinking <laughs> church friends. Literally, I've been sick for the last two weeks, and she was like, "You need to make this hot toddy with this dark liquor and all this other stuff." And I was like, "I don't have any of that." And she goes, "Ask your pastor." <laughs> And so I guess the thing that I want to celebrate about that. So Valerie is a crier and she a lot and not in a way that drags other people down, right, but right. in a way that allows other people to be emotional. Mm -hmm. These are women that I feel like I could, I have told them things that I wouldn't have told any other people. I have shared information about myself that I haven't shared, like outside of my therapist's couch, I do not share with people. And it's a way that you are allowed to be both strong and vulnerable at the same time. They acknowledge both your the needs of your body and the needs of your mind. They don't tell you things like, you know, things will be better in the by and by. They're about trying to tell you how to make things better for yourself in the moment. And I just hope that I'm sort of keeping up my end of the, of the bargain in the process. It really is one of the best sets of relationships we've had. I mean, this year we had the, what did you call it, Brittany, the get yourself together meeting? What was it yeah, called? What oh. we did in January. What was that called? I don't know. It was just a meeting. <laughs> well, what, so what, so I don't we know. met, I like we met, we all met in, in, in Mella's house. Uh, and at the, it was in January. Because we need, it wasn't a, it wasn't a dream board, whatever that thing is, whatever. But it was like we know we all have goals. Let's try to be realistic. 
that, you know, because people say, oh, I'm dreaming, whatever. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Let's be realistic. Let's support each other. Let's figure out how to get done. Let's figure out what relationships you need to get that done. Who do I need to connect you with if you want that to happen? I got you meeting. That's what it was called. And I don't know if we're going to do it again this year, but, like, for real, that for me was quintessential brunch crew stuff right there, that moment. But it's, it yeah. was also important, Valerie, because everybody, like they sat there, like everybody got 30 minutes to sit and talk about themselves. Nobody sort of interrupted. We took notes about the things we wanted to talk about. So you talked about yourself and then we talked about the ways we thought we could help you. Or here's the thing I feel like I hear you saying, what is the thing you can give up? And that's like, you don't get that kind of attention Black women especially don't get that kind of attention enough. And so being able to do those things has been um, really important. And we all have, the thing that's also very nice about it is we all have very different styles of dealing with people, of communicating with people. We rub each other the wrong way all the time. But not it's all, not all the time. Sometimes. Okay. Let me tell you, y'all rub me the wrong way a lot. <laughs> we rub each other the wrong way. Maybe y'all just rubbing me the wrong way. <laughs> do better. Do better. But also, I do better. <laughs> but also, there's never a moment where I feel like if I say this thing, this friendship is over. Right. And that's really been tested being the chair of the trustees at a church where my friend is the pastor and my other friend is the minister of administration, where there have been moments where I was like, I'm going to strangle somebody in St. Paul's and the next person, whoever it is, who walks up to me, they will get it. And sadly, I didn't go to brunch with them. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so it has been a trying moment, but I haven't felt like this is the moment that's going to end this thing for me. I haven't, I haven't really sort of, um, I haven't felt that. And also it's really awesome because Leslie Callahan, she brings in all these amazing women and she doesn't hog them. She's like, Oh, Tracy Blackman is coming. I want her to meet all of y'all. Oh, Renita Wings, Yvette Blunder, they'll all be here. I want you to meet all of them. And so when people come, they also get this and they get to be a part of it. And I get to sort of know all of these people. And it's a really powerful, um, it's a really powerful way to live that is difficult to describe, but is invaluable to have. I want to say a word about Melanie because we she's talked a little bit about Melanie. So when you meet Melanie, the I think for Certainly for me, so I knew her sister Melinda first. Uh, she has a twin, her, uh, Melinda Price, who's also an academic. And their mother, I just bless her all the time because she really raised the, she really raised church girls. Like they just, they just, they don't even be meaning to. They just be working in the church. And they, my you know, sister is also a trustee now, accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is her. It's her. It's her mama's doing. Really, she really raised them to be faithful in the church. And I'll, I'll just use this one example. Like, so Melinda um, has a son, James, and sometimes they watch our live stream and they, they just rate, Melinda's raised so right that when she watches the live stream, she gives an offering. Like she just, they just were raised right. I just, they were just right. It's, Cause she understands that if she wants there to be a better sound on the live stream, Somebody got to buy that. I mean, and so she wants to control. It's, it really is. It, it's, it's a kind of accountability. It's not about the money. It's really a kind of accountability that is a sign that they were raised right. And, it, and having met their mother and their sisters, I, you know, it's just obvious. But so the thing, that, the thing about Melanie, though, that strikes you at the outset is she is hilarious. She is... <laughs> She says stuff, and she's, she deadpans. Right. And so she just says this stuff, and you're like, really, Mella? <laughs> you can't um, sit next to her in church. No, I mean, she just that. really says ridiculous stuff. And then, she, and then she tickles herself eventually, but you're already embarrassed because you are laughing out loud. Um, 
what's less obvious is um, how she has a way of kind of knowing what's going on with the people around her and being attentive to it. Um, and it's pastoral. Yeah, it really is. And it's been helpful. Especially with young people. At, like Bri like Brittany. And old, I'm really old, like really young and the really old in particular. So I said, like Brittany, I am not going to be anybody's pastor. I would like to be very clear Okay, we're, nobody we said it was pastoral. pastoral. We didn't say you. Well, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to say she was, it's a, it's a, I know, it's really very helpful. So it, it works in a couple of ways. Um, one of the, and it's kind of unassuming. It's just a gift. So she will say, so she'll just say, you know, I noticed such and such. I, something's going on. And it's also really helpful in meetings because she has a way of sort of cutting to what's actually going on. And because she's fearless, like she's, she, th that willingness to say whatever it is that you think is going, like the funny thing, it's like the, it's the, the other side of that, like the willingness to say the ridiculous thing is also a courage to say the needed thing that may not fall. And she also has a way of saying it that's, it's gentle. Um, and there are a lot of pieces to that, but the biggest one has actually been the way that it's been helpful to me as a pastor in a place where women's authority is questioned. Um, so like while, you know, Brittany was like, let me go see what these two women leading. Like a lot of folks at St. Paul's are like, okay, where are the men? Like in a way that, that feels oppressive. I mean, it's actually oppressive. They never would have said, where are the women when it's it was all men. It's not like, uh, we want to make sure that we have community and we want all of the pieces of the community to be present. It's like more like, so when a man gets here, we can have church. Literally, I mean, it really is like, and I've actually come to say, y'all act like you need a man for a quorum. Like we practicing and we doing all right, but if we just get, you know, so anyway, in a, in a space like that. And you just kept on moving and people were still like, oh my God. But like, it really is, in a, in a way, and it took me, it took me eight years to have the thing that happened that finally made me say, I need you all to see that this is what you're doing. Because part of what I do is just to suck it up. You know, like, I'm like, you know what? I got this, I'm doing the thing God called me to do, and I got this, and I got my girls, and I got the people who She likes me. to let people, she likes to let people come to the conclusions that they should draw about how life should be. I just like to tell them what I want from the end. <laughs> and so she's like, so there's this way that Melanie really, and, and in some ways, like she's been like, your strategy around this is, like, I'm just like, <laughs> Sometimes she'll be like, you can't say it, th you can say it 30 different ways if you want to, but them people are dummies and they're not going <laughs> to get it. And you're like, I'm like, stop talking about the saints. But sometimes, but, but, but sometimes she's just right. Like you are giving this energy right. to, you think that, like, she's like, you think you can say it away. Right. That the problem is that the way you say in it, that's not connecting. And that's not it. Like you're telling yourself, I know what you're doing. Stop doing that. Let me say one more thing about uh, Melanie in particular. She also listens to preaching in a way that's, in a way that's really helpful. Like Melanie will hear the thing I'm trying to do in a sermon, which is fun to have. It's fun. Because so, you're preaching, you're always sort of preaching on different grades, like on frequencies. It's like you're, you're doing, like I'm doing a thing, I'm doing a thing that's for me. Like that's the sentence I like, like that nobody else ever likes. <laughs> like that's the one right there. Why ain't you, that, what, that was it. And they, you know, people, 
are moved by the oddest stuff. But anyway, so you're, uh, there's a thing I'm doing for me. There's a thing, like I'm trying to, Melanie is the lay person in the congregation who always gets the thing that I'm doing for me. Right. She gets, she's like, I saw what you did there. She's like, I don't know why you kept saying that sentence, but, uh, but she's always the one who gets that one. She's, she gets that piece. She so, listens so, really well. So I, I, I have no idea what time it is because this is what happens when the brunch crew gets together. Like we, we literally lose track of time. We, and the conversation goes where it goes. And part of why I wanted to do this panel for all their shade about me not telling them what we was going to do is because what I wanted to do is display this womanist, black feminist authority that you talk about, Renita, and I ask you to see here because I'm going to put you on the spot, that you talk about that this, I know you have a crew, I know your crew, and that this brunch crew embodies, but also emboldens each of us to do yes. our thing. Yes. And so, so uh, how much time do we have for a reflection from Renita? Somebody keeping time? I don't know what time the next thing starts. 3.15, okay. So, so I want you to reflect on what you've heard and then we'll open it up for a couple of questions. And I, were you gonna say something else, Leslie? Um, I just wanted to really quickly say, you know, as a divorcee, uh, particularly from a, a fundamentalist background, when you divorce in church, you know, and you're still part of that community, um, it is almost as though you and your children become children of a lesser God. Yes. Um, yes. And even when I was married uh, and had my children the right way or whatever that means, my church had a two separate... Um, and I'll not name it, they had, but I thought it was wrong then. They had two separate ceremonies for the children born to people who were married and then children born to, they, we had baby dedication day for the married people. I am going to tell you the name of the, 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 the it was Hagar's children day for the, wow. I, this, what I am telling you lovely progressive people is that this is more common. <laughs> What I am here to tell this progressive or no. Kim says somebody needs to cuss right now. What I'm telling you all is that this is far more common than when you all are in community with each other, a progressive people, a progressive theologians, of progressive churches, and that is who you're around. I'm telling you that my experience in fundamental Christianity, this is common stuff. This is common. This is not uncommon. Yes, they had Hagar's day. So you and your unwed self and your unwed children, your, your, your babies, you stood up and they had separate dedications. So when I divorced, I divorced um, under the fear of death because I didn't have any biblical grounds for divorce. I thought God was going to kill me and or the kid. I mean, I was in, I was in my neck. I had to go to therapy for how tight I was waiting for the punishment that was going to come. And so eventually, I mean, this is not a 10 year friendship here. You talk, you're looking at, at least for me, this is less than six years. And we have a thread and these women are, you know, these women are women who my children, I have two daughters and a son, um, my daughters know that their lives, and it's not just as a result of, you know, mom was married and we divorced, but my daughters know these are some fly chicks, you know. And Leslie's they, daughter joined church. She's actually a full-fledged member of Faith I can't Hall stand y'all. <laughs> she ain't getting on my nerves. Let, will you let me? Anyway, my daughters, <laughs> through the... <laughs> Get on my nerves, Mella. You don't say nothing else. Um, the, my daughters, and you guys don't know this, so I'll share it with all of you for the fir for the first time. My daughters look to you all, and they know they are not auditioning to be somebody's spouse. That their lives, and and and, and no, no, don't give me. They're they're interested in in boys and all of that stuff, but they look at you all, and they're like, you know, and Simone is like. 
you know, I didn't know they was that fly. You know, because she they'll be they'll begin to see the things that we tag them that I tag them in because to them they're just you know the feminist preacher chicks that we eat with after church. But no, you know, and so as my daughters begin to be around these women and see that that ha they have full accomplished life, they look up to me. But I'm mom, you know, I'm the chick who yell and get on their nerves and all that. So them, my flyness will always be diminished for them for a while. <laughs> but you know, but they look at these women and and know that. They are incredibly accomplished women, and they are incredibly loving and caring. My son um, has autism, and he can be treated like a different person. But at but at St. Paul, he's just Noah. He just you know at St. Paul, he's just Noah. You know, um, who is not diminished by his differences here and, and, and with these people in a way that he may be in a different environment, you know? Um, and so our family looks up to them and, you know, and, and my daughter has joined. I'm not, I'm not ready to join. I don't know that I'll ever join a church again. I don't know, but I am committed to the work of St. Paul. So I still give. And when Simone get out of college, I'd be giving you, you know, I'd be close to 10. <laughs> Be close to ten. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna break you off. I got you. You just got to wait. I got you. you. Just gotta wait. I got you. You just got to wait a little bit. You know, the baby and getting ready to go to college. I, you got to hold on for a minute. You pray for the full ride. I got you. Even better. There you go. You pray. I pay. So, um, and, and but 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 this is who they in a in a short period of time. My daughters know. Um, you know, Valerie offered, and I'm, you know, I, re, I can talk to these women about things that I could not talk to in my, about in my former house of worship. Um, you know, we would talk about sex and sexuality. We're all single. We have very open conversations. And Valerie offered, she was like, well, when the baby ready to go condom shopping, you see, I ain't progressed that much yet, but you could take her. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not taking nobody condom shopping, but when Valerie comes, you want to take, take her, here you go, with my blood. You know, I mean, it's that kind of support. Um, my, unfortunately, my, my marital situation and my ex, ex-husband is, is not very supportive. And so I'm, sing, I'm, I'm, I'm single parenting three children. And when I'm, ex, I mean, when I'm done, done, when I'm done, when I, I got no more, one of them, all I got to do is say, I'm done, done. And they're like, what, how can we help you? My right. youngest child taught herself Japanese, spent her sophomore year of high school in Japan last year. And I'm not a member of St. Paul's, but before Simone got on that plane, these women were at my house. I'm not a member of St. Paul's. And they said, oh, no, no, no. We're not going to leave here. This baby not leaving. And they came to my house with the oil and put some hands on in my living. We didn't have to go to them. There was no, we doing this after Sunday service. Simone left one Saturday, Sunday morning. They were at my house on Saturday night watching me and Simone kind of each trip because we was tripping. We was like, I, we were both acting out. It was not good. Like she was le like, it was all good until she had to leave. And she had a minute and I had a minute and they was like, you know, y'all both having a minute. Y'all look crazy. Get yourselves together and prayed. Um, and that meant so much to me and my family. It was like, we're not sending this baby to Japan for a year right. without somebody, you know, putting some hands on this girl. And it's been a, a huge They've been influ even though I'm not a member of St. Paul, I call myself a friend of St. Paul, um, <laughs> I, but these are people that I can rely on in a way that I have never been able to rely or expect even in a faith community. I've never seen anything like it, never. Let me say, uh, I'm, uh, uh, Melanie, uh, do, is, uh, are you fanning? Yeah, I, did I, I, I saw you fan. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. I'm a woman of a certain age now. A woman I of a certain age. A and and I, I, I noticed the fanning, and I uh, wanted to comment because I know Valerie knows that I have been in a relationship at least 30 years with about five five or six women, and we have, we have fanned our way uh, through the relationship and have snatched fans out of each other's hands and, uh, and loaned fans to one another and written to each other saying, will you send me my fan back? That's my favorite fan, right? So, I, I, uh, so watching you fan, I just said, oh my, you know, it's getting late in the evening and the sun is going down. Hey, man, that's, a, that's, an old, that's right up there with 10 on the mule. Okay. I, I, <laughs> um, and let me let me first say uh, very quickly, I am stunned at, at God. I'm just amazed at um, God because 
it, it's just interesting, uh, Leslie Moran, who I don't know, but I've certainly you can't be Facebook friends with these women and not have heard her name. It is what she just raised was the very part of, of of today's message that I didn't get to, and that is black women and fundamentalism and authority, biblical authority. That was precisely uh, what I didn't get to and, and just didn't have the time to and didn't feel, fit, fit, feel that it fit it at the moment. And for her to raise it just the way that she raised it because I was, because my whole issue around this issue of authority is about two months ago I went to a conference in Chicago and, uh, and, uh, uh, and a conversation between progressive bi black biblical scholars and I guess conservative evangelical black scholars, religious scholars, and, and progressive black religious scholars. And I had not been in a conversation about biblical authority in decades. Let me just say decades. And I was just in there saying, I, I forgot, are they still asking this question? <laughs> oh, oh Lord, have mercy. Is this still, is this thing, a, is this still a thing? Is this still a thing? <laughs> I said, is they real asking? Uh, uh, do you believe in the authority of the Bible? I'm like, ooh, child, well, what, what was that book I read a long time ago? What did I say? Ooh, geez, I ain't read up on this in a long time. Ooh, I, you know, I mean, you know, there's an answer, but then there's an answer for that audience. See, I mean, I know my answer, but I know the answer for progressive audiences. But I, don't, I have forgotten that audience that believes it, not only believes it, but are articulate about why they believe it. Yeah. You know, I mean, so it's, they're more than just because, it's the, because the Bible tells me so. So I, I had not, and so I want to say, again, biographically, because I'm writing a memoir, so I mean, I'm, everything for me must, must, must fit. Uh, so two months now, I have been on this kind of uh, journey of re retracing this whole conversation about authority and biblical authority, black women and conservative religious traditions and black women and what happens when they meet the holders of the world and what, what happens when they meet women who are just just somewhere else and just forgot that, that there were women who attend churches like that and just forgot that those churches are still out there. And not only are they out there, but smart women go to them. Right. <laughs> And that smart That's women the go way. to them. We just amazed that a smart women go to them, and that they check their brain at the door. We just we forgot, and we have we we are so much into our conversation that we forget there's a whole group of women who are not in these conversations, and that we have left you behind, uh, that we have not gotten to you, whatever. So this morning, I mean, so I just believe it's a God moment. My point is, it really is a God moment for this conversation to be to uh, be raised and to be raised in this context with this this group of women. It's just, you said it far better than anything I could have thought of saying. And I think that you model it so very well. And, and hearing, Leslie, your testimony about how far you were over there. I mean, you were, girl, you was way in there. <laughs> I mean, those of us who from fundamentalist traditions, we ain't been in a Hagar line before. I, I don't know nothing about no, and, and I have written on Hagar, and I don't know nothing about that line. I mean, so, ooh, girl, tell me, how did you feel when you came out the wilderness? <laughs> Women's friendships are complicated. It's complicated, and it goes through seasons. And there are at each and, and in relationships there might be dyads and triads within the relationship. There may be two or three who are closer to each other than the other two or three. And and but it is, I love their language about being ride and die friends. I love the language that these are the women who keep them sane and keep them sound and keep uh, them whole. Uh, and I'm looking at my own. I will ask Paula to please stand. Uh, Paula is my college roommate from back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> um, in 1972, I went to Wellesley and uh, Paula came from Columbus School for Girls in Columbus and I came from a colored high school, amen, where the, there were only about four of us that went away to college. And uh, so I was from a large high school, urban high school in the Bankhead area of Atlanta. Uh, Paula was from the Columbus School of girls and whatever that was I did not know what that was we we called that's this is before 
This was before Facebook and like my daughter who went to Howard for a year, uh, they had a Facebook page for their freshman class. Well, this is when you call people, amen. This was back on the, on the landline, amen, uh, with a pink phone. And so, we, and so we called each other right before college and talked about wh who, what color the room was going to be and what you're going to bring and what I'm going to bring, re regardless. But anyway, we met each other at Wellesley College in 1972. Couldn't have been more different, uh, more different. She was Ohio. I knew nothing about sleeping with, with, the, with the windows up in cold weather and air coming from under your window. I just didn't know nothing about that. She didn't know anything about walking into the room at night and saying, oh my God, it's hot in here. I like, the, I like my walls to sweat. I just like the idea of the sweat. We, we had our moments, but this is my roommate. This is my college roommate and what it takes to be girlfriends down through the years is a commitment. It is looking beyond each other's faults. It's, it is being pissed with each other and then say, oh, what the, oh, what the, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> because you got history. You got history. And there is no place, there's no place in the obituary that says your girlfriend but there should be. There is a place for, and she is survived by. And then a spouse or children or parents who've been dead for years. There is no pew where friends sit. And there ought to be. And so we're, what we're seeing is uh, women who have made a decision. And sometimes friendship is a decision. And that for those of us, if I may use a heterosexual example, that we will love a, love a man and, give, and forgive him 29,000 times. But a girl cut you one time and you never want to be her friend ever again. So, and so, and, 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 you know, so we, have, we are forgiving of our lovers who come and go. But a girlfriend disappoints you, hurts your feeling, whatever, didn't come through for you that one time and all of a sudden you never want to see her again. And, and I, we, have, we have a trail of tears of relationships. And so I know that with my girlfriends, we are uh, in, indeed planning to see each other this December. About five of us are going to meet there in a B&B &B there in Nashville and hang out. And one Husband has four, stage four cancer. The other's husband has dementia. And one is having knee surgery. I'm talking about the next 20 years of y'all lives. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about and the other is trying to figure out how to take care of a mother. And the other one is, and the other is figuring out who's going to take care of me. Because I'm single. And we have made a pact. We've made a pact that our children, my daughter is their daughter, and that my child knows that these are her aunts, and if their aunts get sick, that she's got to go and see about them. And so we, that's a pact we have made, and we, have, we see each other now, and we can see that time is wrapping up. But to have these kinds of stories are precious to have these kinds of memories. And, and as I say to my daughter all the time now, I say, you know, the, it is the good and the bad about your, your life, because she's in the midst of a little boyfriend breakup. Don't y'all put that on the because I ain't supposed to be telling her bitch. <laughs> but I tell her that's how I make my money, I tell her her stories, all right. <laughs> but he, 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 he won the one, he won the one anyway. <laughs> So, but I say, you know, when, when we broke up, when we broke up with each other, we did not have Facebook and texting and all of that. When they were gone, they were gone. <laughs> there wasn't no sneaking texting, no little, no little dinging at one o'clock in the morning saying, what you doing? We ain't do all that. So, so you can't get folks out your life the way we got folks out of our lives. You got to see them again. So, but I will say that even though that there's some truth to that in terms of romantic relationships, but I would have to say that with, with girlfriends, I can pick up the phone with a girlfriend now. We haven't talked in three months, and we pick right back up. 
like we just talked. And my husband always complains. He says, how do y'all get together and all y'all talk at the same time? And we know exactly what she said. And we, know, and we jump over here and we jump over there and we could jump over here. And all of us talking at the same time. But we hear every conversation. Because that's what girlfriends are all about. So this is beautiful. And if you don't have this, that's what we're talking about. It's not up here to, this is the all to call. <laughs> and we do have, and we do have PayPal and give it if I also, but, but uh, uh, you, need, you need, you need some friends. You need some friends. Brothers, brothers, you need some friends. You need somebody that you can tell the truth to. And some man that can call you and say, man, have you had, have you, have you had your exams? Let, let, I, I'll go to see my doctor, you go see your doctor. you got to have a girlfriend who says, girl, you, I'll walk with you with, to, to the mammogram. And so that's what the dear friends are for. And so I'm so grateful. And I want you to put your hands together for these sisters who have just been vulnerable and told the truth. Come on, give God some praise. This is medicine, 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 medicine. Come on and give God some praise because this is what's going to keep Dr. Valerie sane. We don't mean no harm, Methodist Theological School, but every now and then we do get texts saying, girl, is it me? Am I crazy? No, girl, you ain't crazy. It's the Methodist Theological School folks who crazy. Amen? But that is our way of helping her stay sane. Come on and give God some praise. Amen. Okay, we actually don't have time for questions. And uh, so we're going to, we, we don't have time for questions. We're going to get ready to transition by asking everybody on the panel to make one last statement if you want to. Thank you, Dr. Renita, for saying that. But before you do that, I forgot. I forgot to do something this morning, and I regret that everybody ain't in here. I have girlfriends, but I, I, they call me Mama V for a reason. I, one of, one of uh, Dr. Renita's friend, friends and I died. I don't remember when Linda died. But Linda Hollies was a rough woman. <laughs> but she was my friend. <laughs> She was the kind of friend that you would cuss out, hang up on, and have to call back two hours later because she had made you so bad, right? And so, and so, so, so bad. And so when Linda died, people was writing all these flowery words about her on the woman is listener. And I wrote in, I said to, I said to Renina, I might have put it on the listserv first. I have no idea who y'all are describing. Because <laughs> that is not the Hollies I know. Now, the reason I bring L Linda up right now is because one of the things that she used to get mad at me about is she's like, you need to have a ministry to women. I don't have a ministry to women. I just don't. I have a ministry that brings women in. But I actually do have a ministry to men. And some of my godsons are here, and I forgot to mention them this morning, but I want to mention them. Cedric Von Jackson, yeah. stand up. Yeah. <laughs> jo Jonathan, Wall Jonathan Wallace. Yeah. Where does Sidualla go? Sidualla Crawford. Yeah. Okay, and, and the godson that's not here is, is Jeff Johnson, AKA The Shade. And I have two goddaughters, uh, Christina, I forgot my child's name, <laughs> Christina Price, that's not her last name, and uh, Summer, Summer Haynes. Okay. Yeah, so y'all can sit down. But I was like, I can't, my children have come to see me, and I don't want to, I don't want to not acknowledge them. And then y'all saw all my friends, and I can't, if I start calling all their names, what this represents, <laughs> Is the, is the complexity of relationships in this room. Several people are in and out. Now, we are the crew. We're the brunch crew. But for real, there's a ride cr crew that just shows up. And I'm so, so glad for what I know to be the bass underneath the sound of my voice. Yeah. So I want to thank y'all for uh, accepting what we've done here as a panel. 
Are y'all through shading me? Are y'all yeah, over no, it? We're good. We're good. Okay, last words. I'm done, last I'm words. I'm done. Last words. You're good? Last words, Mel. We missed you. The, I miss y'all. I'm so jealous. The, the thing I wanted to say is the other part that we didn't mention is that for Valerie when she was in Pennsylvania, for Brittany and for me and Leslie, we don't have family Right. In, in Philadelphia. <laughs> and so when we go to the emergency room or we have to, right. we get sick or something happens or we need childcare or we need any of these things, we rely on this group of people yeah. to be that, that thing. And so we should also acknowledge like the unrecognized member of this group that is Diane. Diane, Diane. 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 come on mommy. Who Although really just has her. been a friend, a mother, a comrade. Yeah. She's the church treasurer, so we roll out together a lot. And so I think we should also recognize the yes. fact that she is she always with us as well. She actually is a part of the crew. This is Sharice's DNA mom, but she all our mom. Oh, yeah. well. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I actually, I, I truly feel privileged that they let the old head sit at the table. And they do cuss a lot, y'all. <laughs> They do. They really do. And do cuss a lot, don't I don't act like I've never heard the words before, but I know I, I just don't say anything about it. <laughs> and just like they pray for me, I pray for each one of them. And I am thankful that they are all in my life. Thank you, daughters. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. President, did you want to transition us? Honey, the chef about to bless you. So the musicians are about to sit up. We have about a 15, 20 minute break, 30 minute, what is it? 10, 10, 20 minute break. Beignets for everybody. Thank you all.